Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, November 21st, 2023. President Joe Biden says we're now very close to a deal that could see Hamas release hostages it has held since its deadly attack on Israel in October. And in exchange, Israel will release up to three times as many Palestinians it is holding and pausing its military operations against Hamas in Gaza. President Biden holding a White House meeting on combating fentanyl following up on his meeting last week with the presidents of China and Mexico. President Biden asking Congress to approve more funding and strengthen laws to prevent fentanyl trafficking. Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing the founder of Binance, the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world, will step down as CEO and plead guilty to a felony charge of money laundering. And the company will pay a $4.3 billion fine. The Attorney General says it's one of the largest penalties we have ever obtained. A few days before Thanksgiving, we'll have competing views from the White House and a House Republican on the cost of Thanksgiving dinner and the pace of inflation. Plus, Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis challenges fellow candidate Donald Trump to a one-on-one debate. As Donald Trump calls on the Republican National Committee to stop hosting presidential debates or be, in his word, revamped. And an Olympic truce resolution is introduced at the United Nations ahead of the 2024 Summer Olympics and Paralympics in Paris. This tradition started in ancient Greece to allow athletes and spectators to safely travel to the Olympic Games. Today, the resolution is a general call for peace and the hope that the spirit of friendly athletic competition can help reach that goal. The story from Reuters, the leader of Hamas, said on Tuesday a truce deal with Israel was close and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he hoped for good news soon about hostages. The most optimistic signals so far of a deal to pause the war in Gaza and free captives. At the White House, President Joe Biden also sounding hopeful. I want to say a few words about the ongoing effort to bring home the hostages. And, uh, and Hamas has been holding them since October the 7th. We've been working on this intensively for weeks, as you all know. I've spoken recently about it with both the Prime Minister Netanyahu and the uh, Amir Qatar. And my team has been in the region shuttering, shuttling uh, between capitals. We, uh, we're now very close, very close. Uh, we could bring uh, some of these hostages home very soon. But I don't want to get into the, into the details of things because nothing is done until it's done. And uh, we have more to say, we will. Things are looking good at the moment. President Biden at the White House at the start of a meeting on a different topic. CNN writes that Israel, Hamas, and the U.S. are on the cusp of reaching a deal that could be announced as soon as Tuesday for Hamas to release 50 women and children hostages that the militant group took during the October 7th terror attack on Israel in exchange for a four- to five-day pause in fighting and three Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons for every hostage released According to sources familiar with the negotiations, CNN article says an agreement would prompt the first sustained pause in fighting and major de-escalatory step from Israel since the war began. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke by video during the start of a series of government meetings discussing this proposal. Citizens of Israel, ministers of the government, good evening. This meeting, its purpose is to discuss bringing back our hostages, but I would like to begin with uh, something that needs to be obvious. There are some very uh, unnecessary talks outside, like as if after the pause for bringing back our hostages, we will stop the war. I wish to clarify. We are at war and we're going to continue with this war we're going to continue with the war until we achieve all of our goals to wipe out hamas to bring back all of our hostages all the missing persons and to guarantee that there won't be any element in gaza which is threatening israel last night i met together with the members of the war cabinet the family members of the hostages i listened to their distress very carefully they described 
in a quivering voice, sometimes with tears, the nightmare they've been living in. And I said to them, dear families, bringing back our hostages is a sacred and most important mission, and I am fully committed to it. Just like Maimonides said, there is no greater mitzvah, there is no greater good deed than bringing back hostages. We will not relent and not cease until we bring them all back, until we release them all. The boys and girls, the fathers and mothers, the young men and women, the elderly, the soldiers, all of them. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, that video and the interpretation provided by Sky News. The executive director of the United Nations Children's Fund, or UNICEF, Catherine Russell, posting about what she called another horrifying milestone, writing the reported number of children killed in Gaza has now exceeded 5,000. She added, each one is a life extinguished and a family devastated. This must end. All children must be protected. Overall, an estimated 11,000 people have been killed in Gaza since October 7th, when Hamas militants killed an estimated 1,400 Israelis. John Kirby is Strategic Communications Coordinator for the White House National Security Council. He held an online, audio-only news conference today and was asked about U.S. conversations with Israel on the conduct of the war. Our next question will go to Vivian with the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, John, um, I wanted to ask you about um, the issue of safe zones and your conversations with the Israeli government. Um, you know, in terms, there's been a growing concern that uh, they are not adhering to um, either the requests or are respecting the the kind of sanctity of, of safe zones, which have been repeatedly targeted. Um, and especially, you know, we're, we've been seeing UNRWA offices targeted, um, the head of UNRWA, put out a really um, angry tweet about two, three days ago talking about how enough is enough and this has to stop because another one of their facilities was targeted. And so especially as the Israelis talk about potentially pushing their operations south, um, this is a growing concern. And if you could just kind of shed some light on some of those conversations you guys are having with them to try to basically stop this from happening. Thanks. Well, I was not going into great detail of our diplomatic conversations with the Israelis, which we're having literally every day. Um, I would just tell you that uh, as they now consider moving their operations to the south, um, uh, we have said we don't support those kinds of operations uh, absent uh, a cohesive plan by the Israelis to factor in how they're going to be able to protect what is now mathematically an increased, a dramatically increased civilian population in the South because, uh, because they were evacuated from the North um, uh, at Israel's urging. And we were glad to see that they set up safe corridors in the North for people to get out of the fighting there in North Gaza. But now they've added to that population in the South and it's even more incumbent upon the Israelis uh, to make sure before they begin operations down there that they have factored in ways in which uh, they can they can protect those those civilians who who moved at their urging uh, to the south, and I, I think that's really about where I need to leave it. John Kirby, a spokesperson for the White House National Security Council, with reporters on an online audio news conference. U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, Democrat from Oregon, is now the second senator to call for a ceasefire in the war between Israel and Hamas. The first was Dick Durbin, Democrat from Illinois. In a statement, Senator Merkley said he believes Israel is making a massive mistake by waging a war that generates a shocking level of civilian carnage rather than a targeted campaign against Hamas and that Israel is burning through its reserves of international support. There are 100 senators. There are other views, of course. Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican from South Carolina, posting this week the left's insistence that Israel should restrict military tactics to destroy Hamas after the most barbaric attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust is morally repugnant. The Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary, Sabrina Singh, at her news conference today, spoke about the latest attack from Iran-backed militants against U.S. forces in the Middle East and the U.S. response. I can confirm an attack last night by Iran-backed militias using a close-range ballistic missile against U.S. and coalition forces at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. 
which resulted in several non-serious injuries and some minor damage to infrastructure. Immediately following the attack, a U.S. military AC-130 aircraft in the area conducted a self-defense strike against an Iranian-backed militia vehicle and a number of Iranian-backed militia personnel involved in this attack. This self-defense strike resulted in some hostile fat fatalities. And since I know you'll ask, U.S. forces have been attacked approximately 66 times since October 17th, 32 separate times in Iraq, and 34 separate times in Syria. U.S. personnel have sustained approximately 62 injuries, but this does not include any injuries from last night's attack as they are still being evaluated. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Tara, do you want to start us off? Yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll start with the strike. Sure. Um, so this retaliatory strike seems to be the first uh, since these hostilities began where there were people as targets instead of uh, infrastructure or a weapon storage facility. Can you provide any details about why these specific militants were targeted? So I wouldn't say that I was, um, well, let me take a step back. The militants were targeted because uh, the, the AC-130 was able to determine the point of origin from where the um, close range ballistic missile was being fired upon or, or fired um, to the base. So they were able to take action because they saw uh, the militants. They were able to keep an eye on the movement of um, these these militants as they moved into their vehicles and that's why they were able to uh, to respond. I wouldn't say this is the first time we have responded. Um, again, we don't read out every single time that um, how a certain system or capability takes down a drone or rocket attack. Um, we have had other cases where we have responded um, in retaliation uh, when we were able to identify the point of origin. So it's not our first time, um, but it is uh, just something that um, you know has been, of course, publicly reported, and so wanted to make sure that all the facts were out there. Sabrina Singh is the Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary at a news conference today at the Pentagon. Story from Reuters, North Korea said it successfully placed its first spy satellite in orbit on Tuesday and vowed to launch more in the near future, defying international condemnation from the United Nations and its allies. Officials in South Korea and Japan, which first reported the launch, said they could not immediately verify whether a satellite was placed in orbit. This is Washington Today. Story from Bloomberg News, President Joe Biden pressed lawmakers to approve more funding and tighten laws to help block fentanyl trafficking following his agreement with Chinese President Xi Jinping to crack down on the deadly drug. President Biden on Tuesday heralded an agreement with President Xi, who pledged during their summit last week to carry out a law enforcement campaign against Chinese fentanyl components. And his talks with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador on stopping the flow of drugs across the southwest border. That story from Bloomberg News. President Biden met at the White House with his Attorney General, Secretary of State, Homeland Security Secretary, DEA Administrator, and several other White House advisors. Last week in San Francisco, we made important progress with both China and Mexico to strengthen our efforts to address this scourge. During my meeting with President Xi, we took a critical step of resuming counter-narcotics cooperation between our two countries. It was one of the important things we agreed upon. In, to, in, in 2019, China essentially stopped direct shipments of fentanyl from China to the United States. In the years since, the drug trade has evolved. It's moved from finished fentanyl to fentanyl components, like chemicals and pill presses, that are shipped with few controls from China to, uh, Western, to the Western Hemisphere. Chemical cartels use these components to manufacture this legal, illegal substances and smuggle them into the United States. So the United States is going to seek to work together with China to target the fentanyl components. As a result of our recent diplomacy, China has already taken steps to shut down companies dealing in, uh, dealing in illicit trade of precursor chemicals. We're now, uh, and we're not just going to trust that what this, this is happening. We have to verify it. And that's going to save lives, we believe. While in San Francisco, I also met with President of Mexico. Together, we committed to expanding law enforcement cooperation and intelligence sharing to better disrupt the flow of fentanyl and dismantle the violent chemical groups that traffic synthetic drugs in our communities. We've made record seizures of fentanyl at the border this year, intercepting these dangerous drugs before they can get into the United States to do the damage they do. 
We're working trilaterally with Mexico and Canada to quickly share information on drug trafficking trends and threats. And in July, we launched the Global Coalition to Address Synthetic Drug Threats, bringing together more than 100, more than 100 nations and international organizations to tackle this challenge from every possible angle, preventing illicit drug manufacturing, detecting emerging drug threats, disrupting illicit, uh, illicit financial activities, and to enable this deadly trade to continue, and expanding access to evidence-based health services. We have so much more to do, though. We're, we're not kidding ourselves. I call this meeting to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep building on the momentum of last week. How can we accelerate our efforts and make sure that we're delivering real results for the people that are being hurt so badly? Congress also has to step up in this fight. Start by passing my supplemental budget request for national security priorities, including, including significant resources to help stop the flow of fentanyl into our country, as well as funds to strengthen support services for people struggling with fentanyl impacts. Look, I also urge Congress to permanently make fentanyl and related substances Schedule I drugs and, uh, and to take that action to help limit the distribution of pill presses and close the loopholes that exist now for small shipments of fentanyl, and there are many of those loopholes. As families all across the country gather this week with their loved ones for Thanksgiving, too many are going to face looking at an empty chair for the first time at Thanksgiving, because so many people have died. That's heartbreaking. It's, uh, it really is an American tragedy. Just in the neighborhood I'm in, the next door neighbor, and anyway, just tough stuff. People are dying. And, and I'm committed to doing everything in my power as president to get this crisis under control. President Biden at the White House at the start of a meeting on stopping fentanyl trafficking and deaths in the U.S. The Twitter account at RNC Research for Republican National Committee reposted the president's remarks that you just heard and added this. Biden claims he's working with Mexico to disrupt the flow of fentanyl into the U.S., says nothing on the 82 plus million illegal immigrants who have crossed the border since he took office. Congresswoman Ashley Hinson, Republican from Iowa, also responding in an online video to President Biden's agreements with Chinese President Xi Jinping on fentanyl. President Biden's so-called agreement with President Xi on fentanyl trafficking is a real disappointment before they even had a chance to sit down to talk. Uh, President Biden agreed to lift sanctions on China's Forensic Policy Institute. This is an entity that the Trump administration actually sanctioned for its human rights violations against Uyghur Muslims. Now they've done that in exchange for false platitudes now from Xi on fentanyl. So China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, which is also known as the CCP's propaganda machine, said the country is willing to carry out uh, anti-drug cooperation with the U.S. on the basis of equality and mutual respect. Well, give me a break. The United States should not be compromising when it comes to human rights abuses around the world. Instead, we should demand that China stop poisoning Americans with fentanyl and we should sanction any CCP official with ties to fentanyl trafficking. China should be fearful of the consequences of another ounce of fentanyl coming into the United States from their country instead of getting a full-on pass on human rights abuses. Congresswoman Ashley Hinson, Republican from Iowa, in a video post. New details of a federal investigation into a massive fentanyl ring were released Monday, writes ABC News, as officials announced 11 additional suspects out of 23 total in custody have been arrested in connection with the illegal sale and distribution of the ultra-deadly synthetic opioid, which health officials say is a major factor in the country's overdose epidemic. Joining the news conference in Washington, D.C., the head of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Ann Milgram. Fentanyl is the greatest threat to Americans today. It is devastating families across our country and killing Americans from all walks of life. And it is the leading cause of death today in the United States for Americans between the age of 18 and 45. That hit home for us here in Washington, D.C. on April 6, 2021. On that day, a young woman named Diamond Lynch took a pill, one pill, and died 
almost instantly. That pill looked like an oxycodone pill, was sold as a Percocet, and it was all fentanyl. It was fentanyl and filler. There were no real pharmaceutical ingredients in that pill. Diamond Lynch was 20 years old at the time, and she was planning her son's first birthday party. After Diamond's tragic death, DEA worked with our local partners to track down the two individuals involved in providing that pill to Diamond, Larry and Justice Eastman. Those two individuals are now convicted, sentenced, and in prison. But we didn't stop there. The Drug Enforcement Administration is actively targeting every single aspect of the global fentanyl supply chain so that we can put an end to the most devastating drug crisis that our nation has ever seen. So DEA identified the Eastman's source of supply and the people who were responsible for transporting fentanyl from Los Angeles to DC. Those individuals have been charged. We also identified additional distributors of fentanyl in Los Angeles and the pe people who were working to get fentanyl from Mexico into Los Angeles and ultimately to Washington, D.C. Those individuals have been charged. DEA also identified additional sources of supply and distributors in Los Angeles, in San Diego, and here in Washington, D.C. Those individuals have been charged. Today, 26 defendants are charged as a result of our investigation into Diamond Lynch's death. Together, these individuals sent more than 1 million fentanyl pills over the course of a year into the Washington, D.C. area. The DEA Administrator Ann Milgram at a news conference in Washington, D.C. on Monday. She said a fentanyl-laced pill is sold wholesale in California for 30 cents, resold in the D.C. area in bulk, wholesale again, for $3 a pill, and then retailed on the street for $30 a pill. And she said the enormous profits to the drug traffickers means they don't care if some Americans die in the process. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, Matthew Graves, also at the news conference, says authorities have seized more than 40 pounds of fentanyl powder, a quarter million pills, and 30 firearms, including six machine guns. 26 people have been charged. Again, 23 are in custody. From the Washington Post, the founder of the world's largest crypto exchange pleaded guilty to federal money laundering on Tuesday afternoon after he agreed to step down as chief executive of Binance, which will pay a $4.3 billion fine, according to court documents. As part of the plea agreement, he's barred from working with the exchange for three years, According to the court filing, he appeared in federal court in Seattle on Tuesday, local news organizations reported, and according to the court filing, will be fined $50 million. The deal ends the Department of Justice's three-year investigation of Binance and comes months after the firm was accused by regulators of operating as an unregistered securities exchange. That was from the Washington Post. Attorney General Merrick Garland led a news conference today at the Justice Department, joined by the Treasury Secretary and the head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Here is Attorney General Garland. We are here today to announce that the Justice Department has secured felony guilty pleas from the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance, and from its founder and CEO, Changpeng Zhao, also known as CZ. Separate from the criminal enforcement actions the Justice Department is announcing today, Secretary Yellen and Chairman Benham will also announce civil regulatory enforcement actions and the Treasury Department and the, that the Treasury Department and the CFTC are taking against Binance. While criminal and civil enforcement actions are subject to different legal standards, this collective effort represents the whole of government approach that we are taking to combat corporate crime. Binance has agreed to plead guilty to willfully violating the Bank Secrecy Act, knowingly failing to register as a money transmitting business and willfully violating the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. These laws ensure that our financial institutions are not available to designated terrorist organizations, drug traffickers, and sanctioned nation states that threaten public safety and our national security. The Justice Department is requiring Binance to pay $4.3 billion in penalties and forfeitures, 
This is one of the largest penalties we have ever obtained from a corporate defendant in a criminal matter. The Justice Department is also imposing a monitorship as well as reporting requirements on Binance as part of today's resolution. Moving forward, Binance must file the suspicious activity reports that were required by law. The company is required to review past transactions and report suspicious activity to federal authorities. This will advance our criminal investigations into malicious cyber activity and terrorism fundraising, including the use of cryptocurrency exchanges to support groups such as Hamas. While this historic plea is an important measure of accountability, we know that corporations only act through the individuals who run them. That is why we have also filed a felony charge against and secured a guilty plea from Chang Peng Zhao for willfully violating the Bank Secrecy Act. As C CEO of Binance, Zhao willfully violated federal law that requires financial institutions to guard against money laundering and terrorist financing. Zhao, who resides, resides outside of the United States, entered his plea in person in the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington earlier today. Attorney General Merrick Garland at a Justice Department news conference, joined by the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and the head of the Commodities Future Trading Commission. Back to the Washington Post article, court papers filed by the government say that Binance chose not to implement anti-money laundering measures, essentially allowing the firm to become a clearinghouse for all manner of illicit financial transactions. Between 2018 and 2022, that led to nearly $900 million in financial transactions that violated sanctions against Iran, the court papers charge. And Chang Pen Zhao's departure, the paper writes, marks the end of an era for one of the crypto industry's longest standing titans who for years sparred with regulators en route to Binance becoming the largest crypto exchange in the world. Washington Today continues in a moment. People often think C-SPAN is funded by the federal government. In fact, we're a nonprofit organization that receives no government funding. As news consumption changes, you can help ensure the future of C-SPAN's unfiltered coverage of national government and politics. We hope you will consider making a tax-deductible contribution that will support our daily editorial operations. To learn more, visit cspan.org slash donate. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. The American Farm Bureau Federation says that Thanksgiving dinner will be less expensive this year than last year. But last year was a record high, and this year is still much higher than a few years ago. Federation says that what it calls a classic Thanksgiving feast for 10 people will cost $61.17. That's down $3 from 2022, but up $12 from 2019 before the COVID-19 pandemic. And the classic dinner includes turkey, cube stuffing, sweet potatoes, dinner rolls, frozen peas, fresh cranberries, celery, carrots, pumpkin pie mix, pie shells, whipping cream, and whole milk. Congressman Matt Gaetz, Republican from Florida, talked about food prices on his podcast today. Now, Americans can expect to pay more this Thanksgiving for just about every aspect of their meal because President Biden and Bidenomics and Biden inflation are well above the Federal Reserve's target and certainly well above our ability to pay for it. Since Joe Biden took office, overall food prices have risen over 17%. Frozen vegetables are up almost 11%. Uncooked beef steaks up almost 11%. Even the sauces and gravies. You don't think about those being a major cost driver of Thanksgiving, but sauces and gravies are up 7.5%. Uncooked turkey up about the same amount, 7.2%. White bread up 7.1%. And there are so many concerning facts about the Biden economy, the Consumer Price Index, a key inflation indicator, rose at an increased annual rate of 3.2% in October. And keep in mind, though the rate of inflation may be slowing, it is stacked. So all the inflation we've already endured has not been remediated or diminished. So when you hear the White House talk about less inflation, what they cannot tell you is that it is resulting in lower prices. 
lower prices. That's what the American people want, and the prices are artificially high, not as a function of some uncontrollable global feature, but the direct policy choices that Joe Biden and his government have made. Congressman Matt Gates, Republican from Florida, on his podcast. And the White House is pointing to inflation easing when it comes to the price of food and also travel this holiday season. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, brought it up at Monday's news conference in the White House briefing room. Just in the time, just in time for holiday travel, gas prices are down $1.70 from their peak. Airline tickets are down 13% over the last year, and car rentals are down about 10%. And as we start preparing our Thanksgiving meals, grocery inflation is at its lowest level in over two years, with prices for eggs, milks, bacon, and fresh veggies lower than last year. In fact, according to the American Farm Bureau, the cost of a Thanksgiving dinner fell this year. Prices are down for turkey, stuffing, peas, cranberries, pie crust, and whipping cream. We had a big discussion about whipping cream in the back. <laughs> I don't know what whipping cream is. I know whipped cream, but not whipping cream. Anyway, because wages are rising, this Thanksgiving dinner is the fourth cheapest ever as a percentage of average earnings. Finally, as we look ahead to holiday, to holiday shopping, since last year, prices for toys are down about 4%. Used cars and trucks are down 7%, and TVs are down 9%. Lowering costs for Americans continues to be the president's top economic priority, from strengthening supply, supply chains to lowering energy and health care costs to cracking down on price gouging by ba banning hidden junk fees. President Biden's policy will continue bringing relief to American families. Meanwhile, instead of lowering costs for middle class Families, congressional Republicans are trying to lower costs for the wealthy and special interests, lower taxes, to be more exact, including big corporations that are fighting tooth and nail to stop the president's efforts to ban junk fees. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, at the start of her daily news conference, that was from Monday. Associated Press writes that despite inflation and memories of past holiday travel meltdowns, millions of people are expected to hit airports and highways in record numbers over the Thanksgiving break. Busiest days to fly will be Tuesday and Wednesday, as well as the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Transportation Security Administration expects to screen 2.6 million passengers on Tuesday, today, and 2.7 million passengers on Wednesday. Sunday will draw the largest crowd with an estimated 2.9 million passengers. Meanwhile, AAA forecasts that 55.4 million Americans will travel at least 50 miles from home. Mark Zandi, Moody's Analytics chief economist, was a guest on this morning's Washington Journal on C-SPAN, and one of the first callers asked him about food prices. My question for Mark is, why is the food prices still so high? This is what people are complaining about. We can't afford to eat on top of paying for our other utilities and things of that nature. Can he answer that question, please? Yeah, Yolanda, great question. And you're absolutely right. And I mean, the cost of living is much higher. Even though inflation, the rate of growth in prices has slowed, the cost of living today is meaningfully higher than it was two, three years ago. Let me just give you one statistic, and then I'll come back and ask, ask answer your question specifically around food. The typical American household needs to spend $680 more a month to buy the same goods and services that they did two years ago because of the high inflation. So just think about that for a second. I mean, the typical American household probably makes $75,000, $80,000 a year. Now they have to spend $680 more a month. So obviously, that's the hardship that most uh, Americans are feeling. And it's it's the prices, prices have increased for most everything, but particularly for necessities, you know, you know, gasoline is higher than it was, rents are higher than they were. And of course, as you mentioned, food prices are much higher. The, the surge in food prices really, uh, in, to a large extent, goes back to the pandemic and the Russian war in Ukraine. I mean, when Russia invaded Ukraine, that severely disrupted uh, agricultural markets because... You know, that part of the world uh, produces a lot of wheat, produces a lot of corn, 
produces a lot of soybeans, which are very important for uh, soybean oil that's used in different parts of the world. Fertilizer, uh, you know, the Russia is the, was the, is the major producer of fertilizer, believe it or not, around the world. And of course, that fertilizer goes into crops, uh, uh, producing crops all over all over the world. And so that really did uh, a lot of damage. It caused uh, shortages and it caused prices uh, to jump. Pandemic as well. Uh, you know, the pandemic disrupted supply chains uh, and uh, labor markets. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of the cost of producing food is the labor, and it became much more difficult because of uh, the the, uh, the impact it had on, on immigration flows. Uh, and then, oh, I should also mention the other really big thing is the cost of diesel. You know, uh, believe it or not, uh, one of the largest components of of, of the cost of food is the cost of transporting the food from the farm to the store shelf, and that's diesel. And diesel prices took off, of course, also after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So, uh, you know, lots of different things going on. And there, recently, droughts have been an issue in the Midwest, and you know, climate change is playing a, a role here now, and impacting supplies for different things and causing prices to jump. So it's not just one thing, Yolanda. It's a, a range of things. But I think uh, the driving force here is the Russian war in Ukraine and, uh, and the pandemic. Mark Zandi, Moody's Analytics Chief Economist, joining C-SPAN on our morning program, Washington Journal. You can find the full segment with him archived at our video library at cspan.org. Wall Street today, the Dow down 62, NASDAQ down 84, S&P down 9. The Commission on Presidential Debates has announced the dates and locations of its 2024 presidential and vice presidential debates. The three presidential debates will be scheduled for September 16th at Texas State University in San Marcos, October 1st at Virginia State University in Petersburg, and October 9th at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and the vice presidential debate scheduled for September 25th at Lafayette College in Eaton, Pennsylvania. The debate formats and moderators will be announced by the commission later. The commission is a private, nonpartisan organization. It can organize the debates and invite candidates, but whether those candidates actually show up in debate, that's their decisions. On Monday, Republican presidential candidate and former president Donald Trump posted on his Truth Social platform some new polls that he says shows him with a substantial lead over other candidates. At the end, he writes, Republican National Committee must save money on lowest ever ratings debates. Use it against the Democrats to stop the steal, if not revamp the DNC now. He's referring to the Republican National Committee sponsoring Republican presidential candidates debating. One of them, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, was asked about this at a town hall meeting on Newsmax TV Monday night. Donald Trump had said, I believe today or yesterday, he said, RNC, Ron McDaniel, time to cancel the rest of the GOP debates. You've been very, very popular on these debates. Talk to us about the RNC canceling the debates and Trump's refusal to show up at the debate. Should he show up and why? Well, we need to have debates. Uh, whether the RNC should be the ones that are controlling that, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily the right way. That's how it's gone. Uh, maybe as we get forward, maybe there'll be more freewheeling debates. I mean, I'd love to do a debate on Newsmax. We get the former president, me, let's just have at it for an hour. I think we do it on Hold on, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a note in my ear right now. You're booked. <laughs> yeah. okay. we get we'll, do it, we'll do it on your show. We'll, we'll make that. it happen. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think it's important, but listen, I, I, I just, I find it funny people say cancel debates and stuff. Last time I checked, the people decide who they want to nominate and who they want to elect. And Iowans are going to ch- chance to do that. We, so we're going to be we're going to be showing up debates. I mean, we're going to do the debate with Gavin Newsom on November 30th. We're going to do the Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I believe it's December 6th. Six, six, I've been saying we need a debate in Iowa before the Iowa caucus. We got to do that. And we need a debate. And we need a debate in New Hampshire before that primary. So hopefully they'll be able to do that. I think the debates are better when you have fewer people on stage. That first debate, there was eight people, and it was harder to get a word in edgewise. As it gets down to two or three, I think it's going to be a lot more meaningful. Which two or three? You brought it up. Right. Well, look, me and hopefully um, uh, Donald Trump and whoever wants to be the third can come. I mean, that's fine. But I do think he should debate. I think he owes it to the people to debate. Uh, he needs to prove that, that, that he's going to be able to, to, to handle this. And so, uh, uh, but I'll be there. I mean, I'll show up and we're going to debate. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican presidential candidate on Newsmax TV Monday night. That debate he mentioned against Gavin Newsom, the 
governor of California, a Democrat, will happen on November 30th on Fox News Channel. And so far, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has not shown up to any of the RNC-sponsored debates. The Olympic truce resolution was introduced today at the United Nations in New York City for the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games in Paris. The website Olympics.com explains that dating back to the ancient Olympic Games in Olympia in 776 B.C., the Olympic truce aims to ensure a halt to all hostilities, allowing the safe passage and participation of athletes and spectators for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. The International Olympic Committee revived the Olympic truce in 1992, and it's now introduced for every edition of the Games. The Greek ambassador Evangelos Sakaris spoke after the introduction at the UN General Assembly. Greece retains an emblematic role in the Olympic and Paralympic Games as the historical and cultural origin of the Games. The goals of fair competition and personal achievement reflect the philosophical ideals of ancient Greece, establishing the tradition of the Olympic truce, the Olympic flame, the torch relay, which symbolized the enduring bond between the ancient and modern Olympics. During the ancient Olympic Games, a truce was announced. The Olympic truce, a kechiria in Greek, which historically has been the cessation of hostilities seven days before until seven days after the Olympic Games, was to replace the cycle of conflict with a friendly athletic competition every four years, according to the legendary Oracle of Delphi. During the cessation of hostilities, Athletes, artists, and spectators were allowed to travel to Olympia, participate in the Olympic Games, and return to their homeland in safety. In today's world, torn by war and conflict, the meaning of Olympic truce at Kechiria is more relevant than ever. Although the idea of Olympic truce was born in the 8th century BC, it is becoming more and more pertinent. Armed conflict, the use of weapons of mass destruction, cyber attacks, disputes with the control of space cause unprecedented suffering and pain, making the truce even more imperative. We are not as optimistic as to expect that two weeks of truce, as long as the game lasts, will bring peace and reconciliation all over the world and transform the grim reality in so many countries. But it is a start. It may, sh- it may sow the seeds and instill the conviction that only peaceful nations can prosper and thrive. We strongly believe that the young athletes who will make their honest and ethical efforts during the game will be heralds of the truce notion worldwide and convey the message of tolerance, goodwill, and peaceful settlement of the truce. The Greek ambassador to the United Nations, Evangelos Sakaris, at the start of a couple of days of debate at the UN in New York City on this Olympic truce resolution. The 2024 Olympic Games in Paris are scheduled for July 26th through August 11th. It will be followed by the Paralympic Games from August 28th to September 8th. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word. It's free, and get the stories making headlines in Washington email to you every day. Subscribe at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.